wow, this is wonderful. Hey, Sharin, thanks for being here. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm sure more people um, will continue to filter in. Thank you all for being here. This is the best part when we wave and say hello. Um, and particularly now, it is so awesome uh, to see so many friends and so many great faces. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dave Elving. I am the Interim Executive Director here at San Francisco Camera Work. And just wanted to thank you all for joining us. The, the coolest thing, and we were just talking about this. Excuse me, there's a siren outside. We were just talking about this backstage. It's wonderful that we can be together from all over the United States, sometimes all over the world. Can you all hear those sirens? Okay, everybody nodded. We're in a city. <laughs> um, it's so wonderful that we can all be together. Um, but we are in a city, we're in San Francisco. Um, and as a San Francisco based organization, uh, we like to take a moment to recognize that we work and gather on the native lands of the Ohlone people here in the Bay Area. Uh, tonight, we're super pleased to bring you the third event in our Book and Zine Fair. Uh, we've got our online storefront happening uh, at our website, sfcamerawork.org. Uh, we have more events coming up. Uh, and especially, we have uh, a Book and Zine virtual gathering coming up on December 17th, where you'll be able to meet. Uh, right now, it looks like you'll be able to meet about 20 artists who have shared their books with us uh, during the season. So we hope that you can be there. Uh, tell your friends about it. December 17th, it'll be on Hopin. Uh, it's a great way to gather and it's a way to support artists uh, directly. Uh, and in this season of giving, we hope you'll consider donating to Camera Work 2 uh, or becoming a member if you aren't one already. So you can find out about all of that at our website. This evening, we're here to who, listen to Nicole Jean Hill. Uh, she's here to speak about the photography archive of a Wyoming frontierswoman, entrepreneur, homemaker, and image maker, Laura Webb Nichols, who lived from 1883 to 1962. Nichols created and collected an archive of approximately 24,000 negatives in the mining town of Encampment. I have purposely not researched too much of this because I'm so excited to learn about this fascinating woman and see this amazing work. Uh, Nicole, Nicole Jean Hill is originally from T Toledo, Ohio. She's an artist, photographer, and educator. Her work has been exhibited throughout the United States, Europe, Canada, and Australia. And she currently resides in Eureka, California, and is a professor of art at Humboldt State University. Nicole Jean Hill, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. And um, thanks to my friends and family from afar for joining. Uh, it's really exciting to see some some familiar faces out there in the Zoom world. So, um, and thank you, uh, David and Christina, for letting me do this. This is super exciting. Uh, am I ready for screen share? Okay. I'm trying something actually a little advanced this time. And Nic <clears throat> Nicole, while you get that going, I yeah. will. Oh, it looks so perfect, Nicole. <laughs> And to think we were we were worried. I, I'll I'll stop talking in a moment. I just wanted to remind the group um, at any point um, if you have a question for Nicole, uh, you can tap it into the chat, and then we'll have a moment at the end uh, to ask those questions of Nicole. If you'd like to ask them yourselves, you can turn on your camera and do so. I'm also happy to read them uh, because we are recording tonight. So if you'd prefer not to be a part of it. Um, you can just keep your camera off and ask a question through the chat. If you're okay participating, we'd welcome that too. Go ahead, Nicole. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you for being here. Thanks for your interest in the Laura Webb Nichols archive and the book. Um, this is of course in conjunction with the book fair and the book is entitled Encampment Wyoming, Selections from the Laura Webb Nichols Archive, 1899 to 1948. Um, to give you a little bit of a sense of, of how this book, who was involved. Um, I edited the book, um, selected the images. It's published by FW Books, which is based in Amsterdam. Uh, there's text inside. There's a short essay by Nancy Anderson, who I saw is here joining us from Encampment, Wyoming, and myself. Um, it was designed by Hans Grayman and then printed by that printing company that I do not know how to pronounce at the bottom. So um, <laughs> I was going to try to say that, but I'm just going to write it there. Um, and this is the book here. Uh, I have actually only have one copy of it so far. The books are apparently on a boat on their way to me, um, somewhere probably in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean as we speak. But I've seen one copy and it's um, 
I'm pretty pleased with it and excited to tell you about it. Before I go too far, um, I also should give some thank yous to the people that um, were involved with making this project possible. And hopefully Nancy won't um, be upset with me for adding this picture of her and her late husband, Victor, to this um, slideshow. Um, but first and foremost, I need to thank Nancy and Victor Anderson for their work in um, doing a lot of the really heavy lifting in terms of preserving Laura's work and really recognizing the value of it for um, people today, people in the future, um, as well as um, the staff and volunteers at the Grand Encampment Museum, which have helped immensely and been really supportive of this project. Uh, I also wanna thank Humboldt State University where I work as a professor of art and two students really helped, Jake Langston and Chloe Hawkins. Um, Jake did a lot of the, the restoration of the images with me. We did kind of like a tag team on the, on the photographs and doing a lot of the Photoshop work. And Mark Wickland did the copy editing um, pro bono, which was awesome. And then I have I've had financial support to make the book happen by Beth and Bruce White, who run the Brush Creek Foundation in Wyoming, the J.M. Kaplan Furthermore Grant, the Wyoming Community Foundation, which helped um, fund the book um, in uh, exchange for me donating um, a book to all of the public libraries in Wyoming, and also the Peter E. Palmquist Memorial Fund for Photo Research. Um, and that is um, Nancy and Victor Anderson here. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Nancy in a little bit. Um, okay, so uh, Laura Webb Nichols, uh, as was mentioned at the beginning, um, created over the course of her lifetime or collected 24,000 photographs. She also wrote a diary from the age of 13 uh, until she passed away in 1962. So there's 65 years of diaries. Um, she also um, saved uh, her correspondence with people. So a lot of letters were saved um, as well as poems and other writings. She wrote a book about her experience. Um, so there's a lot of things to unpack in terms of um, Laura Webb Nichols and the things she left behind. Uh, I, of course, am mostly concerned with this talk with her um, photography, but of course, uh, I think what makes the photography really special is I also had the opportunity to hear some of the way that she spoke about photography and the meaning of photography um, in, her, in her life. So I wanted to kind of start, for those who maybe are not super familiar with the um, history of photography, I wanted to kind of start off with a, just a little bit of a timeline to show where she fits in to the bigger picture. Um, photography is invented in 1839 and for several decades up until the late 70s, it was a wet plate process, which meant that the surface that was being exposed to light had to be coated with wet chemistry and the time frame from taking the image to developing the image had to be almost instantaneous. It had to happen in a really quick succession. And what happens in the late 1870s is that George Eastman, who eventually establishes the Kodak company, develops a process for the dry plate latent image where you could have um, the um, photo sensitive materials um, be dry, eventually led to the invention of roll film um, and, and roll photography and uh, the invention of the latent image where you could take an image and then you could wait days, weeks, months, years to actually develop it later in another place. Um, the dry plate was originally mass marketed in the 1880s. Roll film is developed in 1881. And it's in 1883 that Laura Webb Nichols was born to Horace and Sylvia Nichols. Um, this is just before the release in 1888 of the first Kodak camera um, and their <clears throat> tagline, you press the button, we do the rest, is based on this idea that, you know, they would send you the camera loaded with film and then all you would have to do is send it back and they take care of all the messy, messy developing and printing, etc. And Laura's going to be pretty interesting in terms of her timing here. She actually gets her first camera around Kodak number two, 
um, and did the developing all herself and imported a lot of that, those um, materials in the, uh, in her homestead in Wyoming. Now I wanted to kind of also, before I talk about Laura, give a little bit of a um, context for some of her contemporaries uh, in the American West, um, just to kind of get a sense of maybe other archives that are out there. The first one is the Solomon Butcher Archive. Uh, I used to live in Nebraska and I used to take my students um, to Lincoln, to the Historical Society to see his glass plate negatives. Um, there's about 3,000 of them that survived, and 1,000 of them are very similar to the one on the left. He photographed the settlers on the Nebraska plains that were in these sod homes, and um, uh, that image on the left is very typical of a Solomon Butcher photograph. Evelyn Cameron was a photographer based in Terry, Montana. She was, the, um, she was of a very wealthy merchant family, and followed her husband to Montana and photographed a lot of the culture and her friends and family in, um, in Montana. There's a lot of differences in terms of the socioeconomic um, position of these photographers compared to Laura Webb Nichols, um, but just to kind of get a sense of, of what was happening around her at the time and what we know about in other archives. Uh, I actually see, um, a greater aesthetic connection in Laura's work to non-regional photographers. Um, French photographer Jacques-Henri Lartigue, who was um, started to photograph as a young boy. So a lot of his work is notable for its humor and content because he's you know, photographing from a kid's perspective. And you see a lot of that in Laura's early work because she got her camera uh, when she was 16, and you can kind of see this sort of youthfulness in her work. Um, her later work, I think, um, has kind of a formal approach that aligns a little bit more with August Sander, and also this sort of um, typological desire of August Sander, because you'll see as we kind of look at some of these images that Laura had this desire to, she, she understood her sort of place in, in, in history and time, and did a really amazing job of record keeping and and photographing um, people in a very systematic way. Um, okay, so Encampment Wyoming, it's the name of the book. And um, Encampment Wyoming is northwest of Denver. It's actually due north of um, Steamboat Springs. And if you've ever driven across I-80, you get to Rollins to get gas or something. If you went due south from there, that's where you'd find it. it has a current population of 450. and um, uh, I kind of wanted to uh, give just a little bit of history about how I got involved in encampment. I did an artist residency program in 2012 called the Brush Creek Foundation Residency. And um, I went there just to work on my own artwork, my own photo practice. And while I was there, they asked, um, the residency was on this very sort of isolated um, cattle ranch and sort of weird retreat. Um, space, they asked us to do a public talk um, somewhere during our visit. And it was during that uh, visit, during that, in that residency, which was near encampment, that they invited us to give a presentation at the Grand Encampment Museum. And the Grand Encampment Museum is this really delightful interpretive museum that, you know, has a bunch of um, items and buildings and, and tools that have been donated over the course of time. Um, that sort of celebrates the mining history, the ranching history of the area. The image on the left is what their most, um, one of their favorite things is their two-story outhouse that they like to show people. And the image on the right is um, actually taken when I was there for the um, residency. And what they talked about when I kind of researched the Grand Encampment Museum was, well, we couldn't get in because we were doing the presentations in the evening. But I went to their website because I was like, I want to know what this place is all about. And it said on their website that they housed an archive of uh, this female photographer that had 24,000 images and that received the camera when she was 16. And I was already familiar with, with Solomon Butcher. And I knew that Solomon Butcher 
you know, only, I mean, only had, he had 3,000 images and I thought 24,000 images, that must be a misprint. And then I thought, but you know, it's a female photographer, 16 years old, getting a camera in 1899, that sounds really exciting. I didn't have time to look at the archive that summer in 2012, but I was driving through the area um, the following summer and I decided to stop for a couple days to try to spend some time and just learn about the archive because it sounded really interesting. In advance of my visit, I uh, tried to find as much as I could about Laura Webb Nichols on the internet, which there wasn't much, um, but I found this book by Nancy uh, Anderson and uh, Laura Webb Nichols, Homesteader's Daughter, Miner's Bride. And uh, I wasn't really sure what to think about the book, um, but I figured, well, I should know everything I need to, I can find on her before I show up at this museum and, and start looking through the photographs. Um, the book is actually super engaging. Uh, it's Nancy took um, highlights from Laura's diary that really focus on the sort of earlier sort of frontier years of um, like sort of the age of 13 through like 20 or so. Um, and the voice of, of Laura was so um, captivating and so felt so contemporary. And also Nancy's voice in it as well. Um, they just seemed like two really fascinating people. And I just devoured the book and I just couldn't wait to see the photographs. Um, when I got to the museum, uh, it turned out that the, the archive wasn't actually accessible in its entirety. Um, the picture on the left here is um, one of many photo albums that were sort of strewn about the museum. Um, some of them had been taken apart. Some of them were still together. Uh, I found a couple of random pictures that had been matted, um, like this one of the guy in the pug. But I, I wanted to just look at all of them. And uh, it, was, it was really hard to do that because <clears throat> what had happened is that Nancy and Victor had recognized that Laura's work had been um, preserved, um, had been um, available, and had been, um, what they did was they contacted, which was super awesome and smart, the George Eastman House in the 1990s and Colorado State University and said, what do we do with these pictures? How do we save these? What do we do? And Nancy learned about um, vacuum sealing and freezers and all of the things that you need to do to kind of keep things like that stable. And also learned about getting a scanner and the proper protocol for scanning images. So over the course of, I believe, a decade, um, Nancy and Victor and other volunteers that were somehow associated with the um, Granite Cabot Museum spent time um, scanning all of these images to really high standards uh, in terms of scanning and did a really excellent job of preserving it. But the problem was that what they had saved it to had then sort of technologically evolved since the 1990s. So all of the images were on these things called DVD-RAM disks, which um, are DVD-RAM drives, which sort of were the precursor to DVDs. And each picture they, they at the museum, they set me up with the computer station and the DVD RAMs. Each picture took about 90 seconds to pop up on the computer screen. So if you're taking 90 seconds times 24,000 photographs, it's gonna be nearly impossible to, to get anywhere. So during this time, um, I actually had the chance to meet Nancy and uh, she sort of voiced her disappointment that I was showing up randomly from California and wanting to look at it and I couldn't. And she seemed um, you know, a little bit stuck on what to do. So I didn't totally know what was in the archive entirely, but I, I took on the work of helping her figure out what to do with these images. I was able to see some of the photographs. So Nancy had put together an exhibition of work called Tapestries um, at some point, and some of the work is on view in the Grand Encampment Museum. I wanna say off the top of my head, there's maybe like 10 or 15 that were up there. Of pictures of Laura's children. Um, this is one of them, I, I believe, that's in that um, tap tapestries exhibit from 1906. And a lot of them were actually like 
these pictures of Laura's, which um, really speak to the um, mining history of encampment. So on the left is a picture of this family. And in the background, there's this elevated tramway, which was used for to bring water from the river to the smelt, or to bring the, um, sorry, the copper down to the smelter from the mine. And um, that was kind of like a, a 16 mile long tramway that's a really big part of encampment history. So the image on the right is the water pipeline that brought water from the river to the um, smelter as well. So a lot of pictures that were about the sort of industrial nature uh, and the, the mining in industry. I kind of wanted to see other side of things. I was really fascinated by the idea of this 16 year old girl with a camera taking pictures then from that point onwards and what other kind of moments of life could be visible through that lens. Um, I saw this picture somewhere. I think it was like one of the images that kind of popped up when I was sitting at the computer with the DVD Rams waiting 90 seconds for every image to show up. And uh, I was just captivated by it. I, it reminded me in a way of sort of the opposite side of the Evelyn Cameron photographs where everyone's always prim and proper in a perfect hat and a perfect dress. And here, um, Laura has photographed her friend, Mary Anderson, taking that hair down and brushing it out and seeing that just um, real life intimate moment, I thought was um, really exciting. So I didn't actually know much about the Laurel of Nichols um, photos for uh, quite a while because what my, my sort of charge was um, upon talking to Nancy was to get the images off of the DVD RAM drives into a more accessible format. And it involved a very unsexy a task of just sitting at a computer, putting this in and waiting and transferring them onto a hard drive, eventually converting them to JPEGs and TIFF, um, the TIFFs to JPEGs and PDFs so that they can be looked through um, more quickly. In the meantime, while I was doing that, which actually took about two years to go through that process, um, I spent time returning back to Wyoming to read Laura's um, diaries. Uh, I had the um, ability to actually read the original diaries. Um, this was many of them just spread out across the table. Uh, it was kind of cool because some of her earliest diaries, um, the ones kind of underneath the stack on the left-hand side, were made by her um, cutting up craft paper, uh, not craft paper, um, meat packing paper that like meat would come in and then turning that paper into, um, into her little diaries. Eventually she gets a typewriter and typewriter and they got a little bit easier to read. But I spent um, a few summers returning back um, and reading uh, more about Laura's life and history. Um, so this is one of the photographs from the book. And this is the family, Laura's family um, at Willow Glen, which is the name that her family gave to the homestead near the Encampment River. It's actually largely unchanged from, from when they lived there. Um, it's a very peaceful little pocket in this small little valley. But they moved to this Willow Glen uh, when Laura was three years old. She began her diary in 1897 when she was about 13, 14 years old. And in 1899, when she was 16, she received a camera from a local miner named Bert Oldman, who was courting her at the time. He was um, quite a bit older than her. Um, and um, based on the diaries, it seems like maybe her parents weren't super excited about that, but um, they did eventually get married. But uh, Bert gifted her uh, for her birthday one year, a camera. And so um, that's kind of where her photographic journey begins. And so she's in 1899, she starts making photographs. And the early photographs are kind of what you would expect a 16 year old to make. So pets, friends, 
dressing up, um, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of uh, um, these moments that look both like from the you know early 20th century, but also feel like they're the same exact photographs I was maybe making when I was 16 in a way. Um, let me see here, go one more. Uh, there would be photographs like this that were really exciting. Um, double, she would write in her notes and all of the, the captions that I have here are derived from Laura's really impeccable record keeping combined with Nancy's ability later to connect all the dots with the negatives and the notes and a massive spreadsheet that we now have. Um, but it was kind of cool to kind of see the way that Laura, you know, talks about like these experimental double exposures. This is a picture of Laura herself. She was also a very avid musician, played the banjo, played guitar. Um, so um, again, these are a lot of the earlier photographs of Laura's that I ended up finding. Um, I'm going to read just a little small diary entry because I think it will give you a good sense of um, uh, the way that reading, reading her diary went. And what I mean by this is what you'll see is that there's like photography is totally interwoven in her everyday life. And um, okay, so this is an entry from August 11th, 1900. This morning we ironed and while we were eating dinner, we heard Mac bark and mom went to see what was the matter. It was Tad and Tot and Ono were, were with her. They were all going raspberrying up in the hills to be gone for three or four days. The grown-ups camped down in the lane. After the girls went, I took the Kodak and took Felix's picture for Charlie's special benefit and then started down to take a scene and get the mail. When I got to the gate, the girls were just starting up the hill, so I thought I'd go a ways. When nearly to the top of Finley Hill, uh, I took a photo of the girls on their horses. Um, came on down and took Whiskers photo, photo and then went after the mail. I like those Wilcock girls. They are so pleasant and nice. Developed my film tonight. Felix was fine. Whisker was pretty good and the rest all about usual. So the diary entries like kind of always like interweave like ironing, cooking, cleaning, getting the mail with um, maybe family drama or um, thoughts about different people in your life and then taking pictures, developing pictures and how they turned out. And all of these things are kind of, you know, in tons of, of diary entries throughout her entire life, which is, um, I think, really interesting the way it was interwoven. Um, this is another picture. So a lot of the pictures, of course, are of girls and women um, in the first part of the archive because um, you know, she's an encampment. Um, she eventually is married to Bert Oldman, her first husband. The men are often at the mines or in the forests working, and the women are at home raising children, chopping wood, doing all the things. So this photograph here I thought was really special. I mean, it's a picture from 1906 of a woman breastfeeding. And, you know, I always kind of think about this one the expression on the woman's face is just really sort of ambiguous but loaded and uh, who knows what they were like talking with as she was making this picture and I just like to think that they both knew it was, it was like a scandalous thing to make a picture like this but it was made anyways and now um, it's here for us. <laughs> Um, and like the picture on the left, like I was saying, um, that really captivated my attention at first, um, I really like to see the daily rituals that are revealed through the photo archive. Um, the grooming of hair is something that I see a lot in, in the work. Um, and what's interesting to me is not only the hair, but also, um, also getting to see the interior spaces. So the photographs are really interesting to see their furniture, wallpaper, um, decorations, things, things of that nature. Also, I think what's really notable um, about Laura's work, and it's what I was saying about the connection to the French photographer Lartigue, is there's like so much play happening. Um, you know, she's getting this camera when she herself is still a child. She's photographing her cousins and her 
friends. And there's also because it's Wyoming, there's not really a big difference between the way that young boys and young girls would spend time. So the girls and boys are all climbing trees and, um, you know, swimming in the river and doing those sorts of things. So it's kind of interesting to see the sort of gender um, uh, situation in terms of the photographs and how they spent their time and how she chose to photograph um, her daily life in that way. The other thing that I think is really notable about the collection um, is there are a lot of photographs of women conducting chores, um, shoveling snow, washing clothes, chopping wood. Um, and what is really interesting to me about these photographs is that Laura's family was not wealthy. Um, she does eventually start to make money from her photo practice, but photography at that time was not necessarily cheap, but she's choosing to photograph these moments of everyday life. Um, and I, so I feel like that's really special within the history of photography as a whole. Um, and some of the insight that that gives us into um, the activities that were happening around this era. Uh, Laura was a super impeccable record keeper, and I think she also had just sort of this awareness of, of history and, and the importance of the cultivation of the homestead and, and the landscape and the, and the community as a whole. And really, I think, understood how photography could capture the passage of time in a really interesting way. So throughout the archive, there are photographs that she took every year of her Christmas trees, and these range from the Christmas trees in the log cabin that they first lived in at Willow Glen to later when she moves to California and then back to Wyoming again. So it's a really interesting thing to kind of see this passage of time through the Christmas tree every year. And also kind of like that as well, Laura had six children in total. And every year she photographed them with the birthday cake with their age on it. So it was kind of cool to kind of go through and see um, Ezra and Dick and sort of see um, them at the different ages with the birthday cakes and um, how their clothing kind of changes and um, hairstyles kind of change, but um, you still get the birthday cake every year with your <laughs> initials and your um, age. <clears throat> So another, I think, really important um, facet of Laura's work is that she actually, from a very young age, I think, or in um, time, I think as early as 1906, was actually getting hired by the local um, um, mining companies to photograph um, the industry images that they needed. So she was actually getting paid to um, make pictures uh, with her photography in her 20s um, at the mines. I think a lot of these photographs don't, didn't actually end up in the archive because um, sort of what I can tell, I think that, that a lot of those negatives would have ended up in the mining company's hands, but you still see some of them sprinkled throughout um, the archive that, that we have access to. Uh, and part of this is actually one of, I think, the most difficult things to read about Laura's life is that she made, you know, decent money uh, doing photography. And she even writes in one of her diary entries that she was able to make, uh, you know, twice as much as what a miner made in a day working a half day doing photographs. And I think that being in that position with her family caused a lot of contention with both her first and second husband. Um, and there's not a lot of, that's spoken directly about that in the diary, but just kind of reading between the lines, you can kind of see uh, that it was a struggle for her in her, um, in her personal life. Um, and I think one of the reasons that I say that too is that one of the most prolific periods of time is actually between her first, um, it, for photography, was in between her first and second marriage. So um, she had a home dark room through her first marriage and was doing a little bit of that like industrial work for higher work and photographing for other families and photographing her own family. And in 1911, a year after she um, gets a divorce from her first husband, 
her photography business starts really humming and it's still based out of her home dark room. Um, she does a correspondence class in bookkeeping. Uh, she's able to borrow some money from her brother to get um, uh, larger freight orders of chemistry. Um, she also rented out cameras to other people and so would um, pay for a stockpile of cameras and then rent them out. And uh, it's the most exciting time in her life in terms of what's presented in her diary from 1911 to 1914 when she gets married the second, um, to her second husband. Uh, she also was corresponding with a photographer named George Irving who was based in New York, but had come to um, encampment to do some photo work for the mines. Somehow she got connected with him. They wrote back and forth about photo paper developers um, and cameras. And eventually he sells her his five by seven camera for $15. And um, so that was kind of an interesting connection that she makes and she sort of writes about this um, way that she learned some of the technical stuff of photography through, through George Irving. Um, uh, so during that time, 1911 to 1914, um, she just continues to make a ton of photographs and supports her family as sort of a single mom with two kids at this point. And so these are some of the pictures I really love because, you know, I get to see the um, sort of unedited scans and I can see like on the picture on the left, you can see her son Bert holding up like a piece of white paper behind Sylvia as Laura takes the picture as like a backdrop. The same thing with the flowers, you know, she was probably making this and then enlarging it and cutting them out and doing all kinds of exciting things with it. But we sort of see this unedited version of, of some of this. Um, the other thing that you see, um, oh, I guess I should say before I move on to the next slide, she gets remarried in 1914 and, and ends up having four more children and her photography kind of goes a little dormant during that time when she has for um, more children in pretty quick succession. Um, so there's a, a period of time where the photo photographs go into a little bit of a lull. She's still photographing, but not as much. But it's also really, um, the family gets in a really, really bad financial situation. So a lot of the diary is a, a financial, like a captain's log of sort of financial desperation. A couple of interesting um, things about the archive as well is um, you see illness in the Laura Webb Nichols archive. The image on the left to me, um, I it was originally quite striking just because you know it looks like a girl sick in bed and then connecting the dots to um, Laura's notes about it. This was Billy Walker, her friend in a TV tent. Um, so quarantining in Laura's front yard in 1924. The picture on the right is a photograph um, of Dale Nichols and the notes said it's photographed for the Shrine Hospital. So I think there was also this like level of communication. The photographs were being used to communicate to doctors, you know, down in Denver or whatever um, to document things happening. So there's another interesting kind of aspect of the archive. Also, I felt this one was appropriate to show. This is her um, second husband, Guy Nichols, um, recovering from the flu pandemic of 1918-1919. Um, and in 1925, she's had, she now has six children. She's got a husband who really struggles to find any kind of financial stability. Um, and so she decides to take take the control of things and opens up a business called the Rocky Mountain Photo Studio in downtown Encampment. Um, she was the main proprietor of this business from 1925 to 1935. And the Kodak, um, the Rocky Mountain Photo Studio was a Kodak photo finishing outpost. So um, uh, she, the, the mining industry had sort of ended in Encampment by this point and uh, she opens up this photo finishing studio. The photo finishing um, studio, she was given permission by Kodak to operate under their name, but it was under the condition that she does did no portrait work at the studio. 
And I, I have not been able to actually find exactly what that meant. Um, she wrote about that in her diary. My suspicion is that Kodak with the photo finishing studio really wanted people to be taking their own pictures out in the world and then bringing them into the photo finishing studio to have their negatives developed and printed and didn't want maybe people to feel like they needed to have a professional photographer make the images. So Laura sort of circumvented this by um, just taking pictures right outside of the studio. So for that 10 year span of time, there are a ton of pictures and this is a guy, um, the town kind of turned more into sort of a tourist destination for, for fishing and hunting. And I love this little series of images because you can sort of tell that this guy's super excited about the fish. And then Laura's like, okay, let me take it this way. Or now let's move this way. Oh, and now let's try it with the sun, you know, from this direction. Um, and sort of seeing her thought process um, as she makes those images. Uh, in addition to running the photo business um, to support her family and her six kids, um, she also works seasonally as a cook at some of the local um, ranches. And she photographed the fellow, her fellow cooks and housekeepers that were working at these spaces. So there's kind of an amazing selection of um, mostly women that were working in that sort of support industry, uh, sort of underlying the dude ranch um, stuff that we might um, think of as being the most you know, visually appealing or interesting. And then Laura is also photographing the women who were doing the cooking and the cleaning um, behind the scenes and also making these really, I think, um, captivating portraits of them. Um, because she's in encampment now for several years and photographing for several years, um, a lot of her photographs that were like of children eventually become um, those people become teenagers, they become young adults. Uh, there's a lot of like sort of um, engagement portraits um, and portraits of young couples that show up in some of that later work. This is one of my favorite ones of that. This is uh, Alma and Ted Higby and Ted was one of her employees. Um, he's got apparently a broken finger from doing God knows what. Um, and in addition to, I think, just wanting to show this because I think it's a lovely portrait, uh, Laura and her collection also collected all of the negatives by the people that worked under her at the Rocky Mountain studio. So she was, um, people were hiring uh, photographers to go out and photograph events or photograph things for the ranches um, and uh, working under her and then she was saving those negatives as well. This is one of my favorite pictures. Um, and this is like one of the themes that I think is really cool. Uh, photographs of camping trips, which they called pack trips. So people just going out on horseback out into the, the woods, um, sometimes just for pleasure. And sometimes, you know, for other purposes to scout things out or whatever. Um, but she was always in the thick of it, taking pictures and chronicling that, um, that experience as well. These next few images, uh, um, Nancy has sort of dubbed the Sugar Bowl portraits because in addition to running the uh, Rocky Mountain Photo Studio, um, Nancy also uh, ran the local soda fountain called the Sugar Bowl, and which was, I, I believe, right next door, right down the street from, from the photo studio. And in the 1930s and 1933, um, during the depression, um, a bunch of workers came in from the Civilian Conservation Corps to do work in the local Medicine Bow um, National Forest. And they would kind of, their like one stop, like going in and out of the forest was um, the main dragon encampment. And uh, Laura decided to make photographs of these young men. So this is their, this is really interesting sort of selection of images that are of strangers but oftentimes she still collected their names and made these really sort of lovely portraits of these dapper young men. Um, this is actually photographed in the, um, in the Sugar Bowl itself. So she's not allowed to take portraits in this photo studio because it's a photo finishing studio, but she's going next door to the, her other businesses or photographing these people outside. Um, 
and this was, I think, one of the hardest parts doing the book for me was like to figure out which one of which ones of these to put in because they're um, they're also delightful and interesting. Uh, and what I thought, like just in, just noticing her archive, was that it's um, once you get to these pictures of the strangers, Laura had just it must have had a way about her that made people feel really comfortable in front of the camera, and they still feel just as tender and knowable as when she's photographing her sister or her best friend. Um, she really was able to sort of capture, I think, something really elusive in in her portraits of other people. Um, and this one was one of my favorite. This image is on the back of the book. Um, Leonard Gentry was um, one of my favorite sugar bowl portrait images. Okay, and then let me tell you about one last facet of the collection that's really exciting. And that is the fact that when she was doing the photo finishing in Encampment, Wyoming, she was collecting photographs from the, uh, um, pharmacy in Saratoga, which is about oh, 20 miles north of encampment. And people would drop off their film and then she would come and collect it, bring it back to her studio and print and develop it, just like the one hour sort of photo studios of the past, but I'm sure it took a little bit more than an hour. Uh, and then um, also the different dude ranches uh, had drop off points for film. Um, and people from the Civilian Conservation Corps would come and bring their film to her at the studio and she would develop it. And she, she would then save negatives that she liked. Um, there was a cute little note that she wrote on the little negative envelope that you get back when you get your film and it said something, you know, to the effect of, hey, Grace, I liked your negative and I, I pay a nickel for each one. And if you don't like it, you can come up to the store and kill me. <laughs> and then she just would keep the negative um, and then give them the prints. So in addition to Laura's work, we also have all of these photographs that she just thought were awesome. And uh, this is one of the ones that's one of my favorites. This is a group of girls on a, on a pack trip out in the woods camping. And you can see that the girl on the right has a string. So it's like a self selfie, self portrait. And uh, they just all look totally sassy. And here's like other pictures from that same trip. So they're drinking and sitting on their horses, do whatever. And so we see these, this really amazing collection of everybody else taking pictures in and around encampment too. Um, what Laura would do, it was sometimes kind of hard to sort of figure out what, what she was collecting and why, but sometimes it's, you could see certain trends. Basically, girls looking tough and being badasses is like a big thing she would collect. So there's a lot of girls hunting, a lot of girls doing outdoor adventures and riding horses and camping, um, all of those really exciting um, things um, in the collection. Sometimes we know who the photographer is because she took notes and sometimes we don't. Um, and then she also uh, photographed animals, uh, or collected photographs of animals, wild animals, domestic animals, animals doing funny things, you know, whatever. Um, she would take some of the photographs that she um, collected from other people and turn them into postcards that she would then resell at the pharmacy. Um, so some of them, like especially some of the stuff she's taking from some of the workers going off into the forest or going up into Yellowstone. She's taking those images and making these little postcards to resell. Never mind the fact that like from a copyright standpoint, that was probably not such a, would not be a thing today, but um, you know, this was Laura Webb Nichols. She can do whatever she wanted. Uh, and then I think also some of the most exciting ones here um, in the archive are seeing men working and photographing each other working. So again, a lot of the Civilian Conservation Corps, um, I mean, the picture on the left is just, at first I didn't totally understand when I first started looking at the images, I didn't connect the dots and I thought, oh my God, Laura climbed a tree. She's so awesome. And then I realized later that this was actually one from the um, Civilian Conservation Corps workers or one of the other loggers in the area. Um, so it's a really exciting kind of window into other people's pictures as well. Um, and things that they documented, people they documented, um, all of those things throughout, throughout the 
her many decades in encampment. Um, so I'll just kind of give you a little brief, I know I'm like going on an hour now, so I'll try to wrap it up. Just a little brief little thing to talk about the book. So the book, 24,000 pictures. What I did is I went through it a couple times and picked out 1,500 that I liked. I took the 1,500 and I made little um, printouts of them and then I worked them out on a board. And I made a decision that I didn't need to do it chronologically. What I thought was really interesting about Laura's work is the way that people feel really contemporary. Even the photographs she's taking in 1900 feel not much different than the work she made in 1948. So I wanted to sort of weave time through her work. The things I wanted to show was the, the women being badasses, you know, the women hunting, um, chopping wood, doing that sort of thing. I wanted them, they all look really empowered and really beautiful in, in the way that she photographed them. So that was a big theme that runs through the images that I selected for this book. Children, I think, are a really big part of her archive, and they are some of the most beautiful pictures of children. Um, and I, I, you know, portrait of someone that can be captivating, even if you don't know who they are, is the best kind of portrait. And I found that there were just so many of, of that, those in the collection, um, especially of the children that she really bonded with. And also there's a lot of, not a lot, but I wanted to select some of the pictures of the workers, um, like the one on the left. And I also wanted to um, sort of show the kind of community of young people that she photographed as well, um, sort of transitioning from um, childhood into young adulthood and the way she captured that really beautifully. Some of the pages do things like this, um, even though uh, it might not be super obvious at first, but this is her brother-in-law, Charlie, photographed. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the years listed on this, but it's in the book. Um, photographed several decades apart. And also doing some juxtapositions of just uh, photographs that I found really beautiful in terms of their composition, their lighting, and also some of the sort of quiet still lives that she made um, in and around her home um, that kind of break up some of the sections of the book. Um, just to end two more slides, I want to say that part of the book I am going to is for sale on the Laura Webb Nichols website. And for um, just a special edition run, uh, I am doing um, three prints uh, that you would have the option to choose if you were interested in not just a book, but a print. And I'm, I'm only going to do this for a limited time. But I think some of these are just really gorgeous little objects and, and beautiful images from um, Laura's collection. And lastly, the archive of the book is at laurawebnichols.com. There's also a selection of work there. Um, there's a PBS episode that they did on me and Nancy's sort of work with the archive. And if you're in the Portland area, April 1st to May 1st at Blue Sky Gallery is going to be a show of some of the highlights from, from her archive. And that is the end of my presentation. <laughs> oh, wow. I uh, thank you so much, Nicole. I, I know that if we were in the real gallery, we would hear people clapping and excited. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there are a number of moments there where my my jaw was just on the floor. I started writing a few questions, a couple of which were also addressed um, in the chat. One of the first things that struck me is, is what motivated her to document and collect? And I actually would like to invite uh, Brian. I think you asked this question. Uh, really beautifully in the chat. Um, and I thought I'd give you the opportunity maybe if you'd like to ask it yourself. Oh, I'm seeing new messages. I, 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 I'm moving myself. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a lecturer who, like in this time, hi, Nicole, I miss you so much. <laughs> I, <miss> you. <laughs> I uh, have so many questions for you. We met in Wyoming at, at that time, I was there at in, in encampments with you when, and I don't, but I was not privy to that stuff. But um, I have so many questions. The most I want to say is, uh, there's wine involved. But <laughs> so, oh my god, way to go! <laughs> so, I'm so happy to be here, and I, I 
like your interest in like your work was about going into the woods, finding those places where people hang out. And also like, but your love also of those journals and stuff, like the, the like responding to where you are. And what what's your connection to Laura with it? Like where, where, where did it all start there with words and image? But I don't want to start, I'm sorry. No, that's good. Uh, well, hi, Brian. It's so nice to see you. Yes, Brian uh, was at the residency with me in 2012, which I, when I didn't actually know anything about Laura, but I just kind of knew of the museum. So um, all of this sort of pre um, came after. But I think that there's a couple of things that really resonate with me with the writing and the and the work. And it's, it's a really kind of personal connection. But Laura's interest in photography was an escape from like anxiety in her life, domestic trouble, financial trouble. Um, she, she dove into photography as kind of an escape. And I, and the way she writes about that, I think is, is, is really resonates with me. And there's um, some really beautiful passages in her, in her diary where she talks about, you know, really struggling to find the meaning of life, but then realizing that the connections that she's made through photographing really kind of bring her a sense of purpose and the act of making pictures um, does that for her. So I think that was like, what's really um, sort of kept me motivated with, with that is the connection between her thoughts about that and the pictures. And then also just like, I will say, I don't know if Nancy's still here in the presentation, but Nancy is so awesome. And she's the family friend of um, Laura Webb Nichols and really worked on this. And she's also just an awesome person, an awesome writer, and um, just a really, you know, just, just a great person to be around. So I think that those two things have really motivated me to dive into this as, um, as a long-term project. Thank you so much. If you don't mind, I am going to, just for a moment, we can come back to it, but I'm going to um, stop the screen share just for a moment so we can come together oh, yeah. and, then, and see each other and then we can see a little bit more of you and um, we can certainly return to that. Um, there were a few more. I'm just going to go down the list. There were some great questions. The next question after Brian's um, was from Ju Julie. Uh, Julie, would you like to ask your question directly? If you sure. Hi, Thank Nicole. You. So I, uh, I teach with Nicole at Humboldt State. I, uh, I'm an art historian, and I've told her often how wickedly jealous I am of, of this uh, project. And it occurred to me as I was listening to this that, that it's surprising to me. I feel like we've talked about this a lot. How have I not asked this question? But I'm curious about the, how much she talks specifically in, does she talk specifically in the diaries about the challenges specifically of, main t of doing the work and having a family, like being a mom in particular. Because that's such a thing we talk about with women artists. And I'm just curious how she, how, if and how she talked about that at that time. Yeah, um, I can't remember if it's, I, because in the essay in the book, I pull out some quotes from the diary that I, um, I thought were really telling. And I can't remember if I put this one in there or not, but there's one that really sticks out in my head and it kind of goes back to Brian's question. And it's where she is like, oh my god my four of my six children have the measles where the house is a mess um life sucks thank god i'm in my dark room and my blueprints came out awesome so like it's it's usually about these like you know um moments of like always talking about chores and the overwhelming nature of all the things she has to do and then but thank god I had some time for photography so I think that's definitely a big part of it and another kind of part of that as well just in terms of of kids is that her mother was actually an avid photographer as well and then she passed that on to some of her children so a lot of the photographs that um, are in the collection are Bert Jr's and um, Ezra's so it's kind of cool to see the way that she also kind of folded that into her um, experience as a mother. Colleen, so you just posted a, a follow-up. Do you want to? Do you want to pop in? No, you can just read it, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Colleen. Uh, 
tapping onto Julie's question, uh, it's interesting to think about Cameron or Gertrude Casimir, uh, class, location, time, being a woman, uh, a mother. Colleen, actually, I think you're referencing someone. Did I say the name right? Gertrude Casimir um, or Julia Margaret Cameron or both, just kind of thinking about um, those women of that time. You know, I'm sure, Nicole, Nicole, you've been there. It's so funny that we haven't talked about this, but, um, but yeah, it is funny to think about like the, the motherhood piece of imaging at that time. Yeah, and I think with Laura, especially, I mean, with Casimir and Julia Margaret Cameron, like they were fairly well to do. I mean, the same thing with Evelyn Cameron. And so photography is a hobby and maybe there's nannies involved or who knows what. And Laura is both raising her children, you know, in isolated Wyoming and eventually has six children. And she's like, Oh, I've got this deadbeat husband and we've got to pay our bills and we're in debt. I've got to, I've got to make money on this too. So she's using it as a business venture, but then she's also using it as a kind of form of escapism. So it was really interesting to see how that um, transpired throughout her life. And it's, and it is different from most other women photographers for sure of that era. Did she see it as a creative act or a documentary act? I, I, what kind of a, of a, I guess that's, that's just the question. I'm, I'm curious how she approached it and, and what motivated her? What, was she trying to document? Did, was she in love with the process? Was it, was it something magical about, what? Yeah, I, that's the best I can articulate it. <laughs> I know exactly what you're trying to say because I think that's what I've been trying to figure out too. Um, because I, I, there are just, certain photographs that I see that I'm like, huh, like not everyone would, you know, that's a picture of just a beautiful way the light is hitting that shrub. Um, but then I also know that she really understood photography as a document of record and the way that it could show time and the way, and then of course using it as her source of income. So I think that um, in a way, Laura Webb Nichols' work like manifests all the different facets of photography all in one person, because I think a lot of photographers are like that, right? We do commercial work, um, we do product photography and art photography and portrait photography and, and alt processes, and we're kind of doing all these things and sh maybe shooting for magazines and whatever. Um, and it's just a complex medium. And I think that she maybe didn't exactly have the same kind of words that we might use now about it, but I get the sense of just the way that it intersected with her life and her decisions of what she chose to photograph and then also collect. Um, I think she understood it from a lot of different um, vantage points. What's the, it, so the story is new to me. I, I didn't know her complete story or, or to the degree that I do now until you just shared it with us. And it seems like she was transfixed by photography when she had this camera at a very young age. But then she finds herself at the crossroads of all the photography, like throughout the whole community. And, and she's got this, I don't know the academic term to me, I'm like, it's like this panopticon into everything that's going on around her in her community. And she's choosing these negatives. I was struck by the the man on the tree and his two partners who are posing down beneath him. Like she's noticing those unique negatives. She's got clearly a creative eye and yet it seems driven by a documentarian preservationist kind of mindset. And, and does she write about why she started collecting? Why does she talk about maintaining an, an archive or, or was it just something she had to do? I, you know, I don't remember, well, I will say that, like, um, I don't remember reading much about the collection of stuff she chose to collect. She doesn't really mention it. And the only thing, like I said, the thing she would write on the little negative pack, like, I saved one of your negatives, you know, come kill me if you, you know, have a problem with it. I actually found that negative pack. It wasn't anything that she had written about. Um, so I'm not totally sure about what her thinking was behind the collection of images. I think, you know, it would just probably, I used to work as a photo finisher too. And I, I hate to break it to all of you guys, but if you ever did the one hour photo mat and you had anything scandalous in there, 
all those people saved a special um, book of pictures. And so, you know, I did that in the 90s. I'm sure that's exactly what she was doing, but <laughs> probably not, probably like the PG version of it. Um, but it was part of that. And then another thing that's just kind of interesting that I know did come up in her diaries is that she would talk a lot about trying to figure out like composition and learn more about good composition. And there was some Kodak magazine that she subscribed to. There was um, some Kodak hour on the radio. Um, so I think there were ways that she was um, trying to learn the, the aesthetics and the formal things about picture making. Hmm. Number of good questions in the chat. One I want to jump to from our friend, um, Pete Brook, uh, and, and it follows up on, on a question Alan had about, about how you made the uh, choices and, and created your book. Uh, and the question was, do you and Nancy value the same photographs or did you have different perspectives? Um, we've, that's a great question. <laughs> um, we both really love the Sugar Bowl portraits. And I remember she didn't tell me, she knows the picture. Like I can tell her like, oh, you know that picture of the guy laying on the couch? And she'll say something like, oh, I knew you were gonna like that one. And she probably hasn't looked at that picture since like 1997 or something. And so she knows that whole archive, um, like the back of her hand. And um, uh, so we we both really love the Sugar Bowl portraits. I will say that the, the, the tapestries exhibit and that she had curated and they also had a booklet of like a hundred favorites that some of the people at the museum had put together they're all completely different pictures than what i picked but i'm an outsider to encampment so i think nancy knows the family she knows the family friends she knows the place and here i am coming from california and not knowing anybody and so i see a picture that really you know speaks to me like the one um of the boy with the cat on his head and uh you know if that would maybe be one that she wouldn't have have spent as much time on um mm. so that's a really interesting question mm, i thought so too um stuart you're in the audience i think it's good to maybe ask your question would you like to unmike and yeah it's nicole hi and i guess this kind of high I guess this kind of, kind of gets back to Dave's question. I was wondering if she was a, a, um, a self-conscious artist. Um, you, you know, you mentioned in her journals that obviously they're her daily journals and they record all, all the things that happen daily. And so she goes into the dark room and she makes some prints and they turn out all right. But so that's just like, writing about the rest of the events really going to pick up the mail and so on but did she have kind of like a, a sort of a you know included in that her a, a discourse on her practice and if she did i wondered if if that underwrote any of her aspirations as a self-conscious artist no she doesn't talk about it and i was looking for it i was yeah. i I really wanted to see if there were ways that she talked about aesthetics or form or that artistic practice. And it seems like when it shows up in the diary, it has a lot more to do with, um, with if the, if the picture turned out, like if the negative was developed evenly, if the exposure was okay, not about uh, the, the quality of the image on that next level. But I, but it doesn't mean she wasn't considering it. She just wasn't necessarily writing about it. Right. But I will say that one of the things that I never touch on at all, but it exists in the world, are all of these really beautiful um, photo books that she made for people for like Christmas presents, mm -hmm. where she made these handmade books and did all this stuff. And so that's like a whole other level that she never wrote about and it exists in the world and we still have access to some of those things as objects. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanna, uh, Doug, you have your hand up digitally uh, and a question in the chat. Uh, would you like to unmic and ask it? Uh, yeah, it's not about what I put in the chat. Um, oh, okay, go ahead. Just, just two things. One thing I think it's really beautiful about um, the archive and I've, I've seen, I, I know Nicole, she's a good friend and, and we've looked at the archive and she's, you know, over the years have shown a number of things it's interesting how 
important it is to us that someone verifies something in writing or verbally to denote self-consciousness, but it's very clear from the archive that there's a self-consciousness to it <clears throat> and that she has concerns and that she's repeating those concerns over and over again through the language of the imagery. Yeah. So yeah. the experience of the archive as a whole is very mindful, much like, again, as I said in the chat, like it's, it's like looking at Ache. There's a sense, you can't, you can't define it, but there's a sense of a mind there that's probing and looking and repeating and you're in the company of it. And that seems to be, to me, like what the best of what art is. Um, my, my question on the larger sense was, um, Nicole, it, it's so different to get an archive than it is to maybe like find an, uh, someone who has like specifically said, uh, I'm gonna make the, I'm going to make this work and I'm going to choose these images to represent all of the process of, of work that I've made. Um, what kind of responsibilities did you feel you had and what kind of permissions did you feel you had to edit the archive and create different kinds of narratives from it? I love that question. Um, so I, yeah, it's totally overwhelming, right? Like 24,000 pictures, what do I do? And I, I think actually Doug who asked that question I think I showed him my box of the 1500 pictures that I had printed out. And I was like, why don't you just do a quick edit? And then I looked at his edit and I was like, oh no, no, that's not the edit I would do. He picked out like no portraits, all landscapes, all verticals. I was like, no, that's <laughs> not where I'm going with it. So um, I decided I had this moment where I was like, what is my role here? Because kind of Julie alluded to this, I'm not an art historian. I have no aspirations to be an art historian. I I want to be an advocate for Laura Webb Nichols because I think that she deserves her place in the history of photography and the history of photographic discussion. And so I tried at first to approach this from an academic standpoint and getting an academic book published. And then I realized like, I am not an art history PhD. I am a photographer, I'm an artist. I am going to just make a really sexy book of photographs to get her name out there that shows the different facets of it, like children, workers, that sort of thing, um, her portrait style, and get other people just excited about it and involved in it. And then that is my work. So my work was kind of to, kind of like the question that Stuart was asking about like kind of the formal aesthetic aspects or whatever, to make something really what I think would be beautiful and feel very contemporary right now. And then have people be like, oh yeah, that photographer from the early 20th century, Laura Webb Nichols. Oh, when we talk about female photographers, we can also not just talk about the rich, wealthy housewives, but we can also talk about the women working as entrepreneurs, working in this really unique way um, with the medium early on. So it kind of really, when I had that moment of realization that I am not uh, art historian, um, it freed me up immensely. And that also freed me up to make the book not in chronological order and to edit it like just responding to it in a sort of visual way. Mm. That is a really exciting and interesting way to approach the work. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we have a few minutes left. I, do you feel like you know her? Um, yeah, I do kind of. Um, I have, I've, I've read a lot of her work um, in the diaries and letters, and I've looked at all of the photographs multiple times. I've heard Nancy's stories about Laura. Um, there's so much of a sense of humor in her writing, um, sort of self-deprecating and just kind of goofy. Um, Nancy had told me that somewhere in the Grand Encampment Museum, there is a, a record like a like an old 45 or something that has Laura's voice recorded on it when she gave a lecture and we were not able to find it but I really want to find it because I want to hear her voice and I feel like as soon as I hear her voice I will like have this like interesting sort of complete picture but who knows I mean you know it's pictures and diaries but it's a lot of stuff of, of someone's trajectory of their lifetime. It strikes me as interesting. She is so thoroughly documented in words and pictures, 
but is quiet for now. I hope you're able to find that record. That would be so interesting, but it seems like kind of a cool mystery too. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a few minutes left. I want to just anybody else who would like to ask a question or, or make a comment before we start wrapping up. Nate Martin has a question, I see. Oh, go ahead, Nate. Hi, Nate. Um, phoning, phoning in from Laramie, Wyoming, just over the mountain. Hey, thanks for being here with us. Yeah, no, thanks for putting this on. And I, I mean, I'm, I've uh, known Nicole a bit for a few years because of this project. I'm delighted that it's happening. I'm very excited to hear that uh, her beautiful book will be available to the people of Wyoming um, via the public libraries for free. Um, you know, Wyoming often, you know, we uh, people have a tendency to think of ourselves here as sort of a, an artless backwater. <laughs> and so you know, I'm really happy that this person who's clearly, I would argue, is, is agree with the person earlier, a self-conscious artist, um, you know, master of the form in a certain regard, um, is getting her due. And I was just wondering, you know, from maybe a selfish perspective, what are the sort of the next steps to um, uh, in, in, engage her, engage her body of work with the uh, the people of Wyoming and the place, you know, the place from which it emerged, uh, so to it, it enrich our our cultural life here from whence she came. <laughs> That's a really great question. So this, the, well, so Nate, I met Nate when I first went to encampment to learn about the archive and. He sort of knows uh, some of the backstory of, of meeting Nancy and whatever. And I will say, to kind of keep it short, is I was met with a lot of suspicion at an encampment when I came interest, became interested in this archive. And I don't know what exactly that suspicion, I mean, I think it was like, here comes, I got actually CC'd on an email one time that was like, this liberal from California coming in, what's she trying to do, you know, that sort of thing. And um, so I had to spend a lot of time just like saying like, I'm not a threat. This is like to, you know, promote this and to celebrate this. And I think that's actually really worked. The Grand Encampment Museum, they have a new director named Tim, who's awesome. And he's totally recognized like, oh my gosh, we have all of this, the Laura Webb Nichols diaries. We have access to the, um, the digital files, really excited. So. They're actually planning at the museum to expand their exhibits to include a Laura Webb Nichols, um, a larger Laura Webb Nichols dedicated space. The show that is in, that's going to be in Portland in um, April will be traveling then to the Grand Encampment Museum um, for a, a probably semi long term exhibition un, unless it will travel elsewhere. Um, so there's that, and um, I'm hope hopefully also to have an exhibit at the um, front room of the University of Wyoming gallery that's associated with the American Heritage Center, which the American Heritage Center now houses the original negatives in a repository, and the Grand Encampment Museum has the diaries and the digital versions because that's more of an interpretive museum. All of the work has been uh, assigned over by the family to the public domain. So it's all available for public access. Um, I believe that American Heritage Center soon will have the archive online for people to search through. It will be the unrestored um, version. So the negatives were, you know, a little rough around the edges, but, but those will be available. And then my hope, I guess this doesn't just go to Wyoming, but my hope in general is I have this exhibition. So I'm hoping that more galleries will be interested in, in showing the work. And, and the long-term goal would be like some really awesome go-getter PhD comes in and scoops this up and then takes it to the next, to the next place in terms of really sort of firming her place in history, which would be awesome. Because that's not going to be me because I'm not that good of a writer and I don't have patience for that kind of research. <laughs> but you've done enough, thank you. <laughs> yeah, indeed, you have, you have, I just wanna say thank you, uh, Nicole Jean Hill, for introducing us all to Laura Webb Nichols. Please keep us posted here, camera work, of, of, of your progress and, and, and more work from the archives. This was an absolutely fascinating body of work and a really, really interesting discussion. Thank you for all of you who, uh, Turned your cameras on and participated. That is, is fantastic. As we wrap up, I want to highlight some things that are coming up next. Join us next Tuesday. 
um, for our fourth event in our book and zine fair, uh, it'll be a talk with Regine Romain, uh, Haiti, Photography, and Black Representation. Uh, the work that she has in our, our book and zine fair is actually a coloring book, uh, but she'll be talking about that uh, along with the photographs that inspired that coloring book. And they're just, they're really cool. So I hope to see you next Tuesday. And then uh, the next day following that, our friend Jamil Helu will be leading our members critique. Uh, I know there's some members here who have presented at those in the past. Even if you're not sharing work with us as a member, those are really fun to attend. You get to see some incredible photographers uh, give feedback to other photographers. And then on December 17th, uh, and we're, we're really promoting this. We hope to see all of you and please share it with your friends. We're planning an event uh, with about 20 photographers uh, and all of their books. We're gonna be using a platform called Hopin. Uh, that's coming up on December 17th. So please visit our website at sfcamerawork.org to learn about all of these events and, for and to register for those that are coming up. And of course, if you're not a member, you can become a member and you can always give us a donation in this time of giving. That's it. I want to give a shout out to our friend, uh, Christina Graber, who makes these possible all the time. Uh, and to so many of you who are here today who have been a part of the camera work community. Uh, and if you're new, thanks for being here. I hope that we get to see you again. Nicole Jean Hill, thanks again. And for now, we'll say good night, everybody. Bye. Thanks to all my friends and family for coming. You're awesome. <laughs>